like five seconds. Oh, actually, a little more. <laughs> Sorry, I keep delaying, but I, I keep forgetting that we have an introduction now. The introduction is playing. You're going to give a 30 second, right? Well, it's about five seconds now. Just say go when you want me to go. Sure. You, you'll hear me anyway. Okay. All right, I think we are live now. So hi again, everyone. I promised you we would be back in about 30 seconds. I lied. It was actually one minute. But we are here with Bob. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Hi, doing great. Glad Excellent. to be with you. So, yeah, glad to, be, glad to be here. And so are we. We're glad to have you again this year. Um, so what we're going to do, we're not going to waste any time right now with chit chat. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to move straight into your presentation, Bob, so that you have as much time as you can. I'm going to proceed into the background. I am going to full screen your presentation on the stream. And Bob, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Leo. Glad to be here. I hope everybody has an idea of what hyperbole is, but it's, a, it's an, a, a broad information management system inside Emacs uh, that works in all major modes. It's a, a global minor mode that you can turn on and off very rapidly so that you can just get in and out of hyperbole. And it works mostly from uh, a mini buffer menu that if we just hit Control HH, we see at the bottom of the screen here. And as you see in some of this text right here, uh, D, D will uh, show you uh, a demo with all these video links of hyperbole now. But um, let's just get into the top 10 reasons to use hyperbole. Uh, number 10. Uh, number 10 is a uh, key series uh, uh, curly braces. So you just put curly braces around any set of uh, key sequences that you want. Uh, and uh, hyperbole magically turns that into what we call an implicit button, uh, a hyper button in any kind of text that you have. So if we go down here and we just click uh, click here, we see it. Uh, that was a complex uh, button that said, let's uh, start a shell. Let's uh, set an environment variable, as you see the command right up there. And then let's do a grep over the hyperbole code and find all instances of a particular label. So if we... If we hit made a return, that's called the action key. That's what you use throughout hyperbole when you just want to activate any kind of button. So you see it, it jumped to uh, the grep output. And this is in a shell buffer. It's not in a compilation buffer. So anywhere that you have this sort of thing, it's also an implicit button. And any sort of grep output or a compiler output, you can just uh, jump to with the same, uh, with the same key, made a return. So uh, that's, uh, that's um, key series, the first part. And then um, just to note that you can also just do a, um, well, I'll just do it um, here and show you that you can do um, uh, a recursive grep with this hyperbole command, HYPBR grep. And if you're in an Emacs list buffer, it will just, uh, it will only grep across uh, the Emacs list. So a very handy way to just uh, go through your, your code very rapidly and then jump to various points in it. So we have a lot to cover today. So I'm going to go through this rapidly. This isn't a tutorial. It's just to get you interested in some of the features. And then there's a ton of reference material and videos now available for hyperbole. So let's go to number nine. Um, path names become implicit buttons. You don't even have to quote them, and you can add environment variables or elist variables with the syntax right here. So here we have a shell script that's somewhere on our path. And notice path is a, an environment variable with many different uh, paths within it, right? But hyperbole knows that, and it searches the path, gets the first match, uh, finds it and finds the actual shell script. So you can just embed that anywhere. Here we have a list variable, hyperbdir, which is the home directory for hyperbole, and, and then uh, a markdown file and a link to a direct section in the file. 
and the five colon five means go to line five within that section and column five. So let's just try it. Boom, we're right there and we're on another link that we could activate as well. So notice the next line is the same link, but this is how you normally have to do it in a markdown file. You have to change the section header to have dashes, but with hyperbole, you don't have to. You can just put it exactly like you see it in your file. Uh, here, the pound syntax uh, for sections is really a generic syntax in the hyperbole. And uh, so it works in all different kinds of files, your programming files. Uh, here's a shell script. And we said, uh, let's just go to the first comment that has alias in it. Notice we didn't have to say the whole line, just the first part of it, and it matched to it. Here um, we have um, a link to our hyperbole uh, structured outliner called the K outliner. And you can see it auto numbers all these cells. But in addition to just displaying, you can also add a pipe symbol near the end and use this uh, view syntax to clip to two lines and show blank lines. So let's see if each node gets clipped to two lines. So you see they're all just two now with the ellipses, and then we can expand them. So a lot of power there just, uh, just with path names. Let's uh, continue yeah. to number eight. Can I just interrupt you just a bit? Yes. I think your phone, uh, your, so we have your phone set up in case your internet uh, misbehaves and we've set up, said this up before we started, uh, but I think the vibration is a little loud oh. whenever it does. Can you maybe move it a little bit? Is that is that okay? Uh, I, I think stopped. so. Uh, it will have to vibrate again. <laughs> no, my phone, okay. I just, it shouldn't have been vibrating. Could be me. Uh. <laughs> It might have been another uh, device, but uh, definitely we had vibration. Anyway, carry on. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. Uh, so number eight, uh, special prefixes. There are three prefixes you can attach to path names. The first, if you want to load, instead of just uh, finding a file, um, an e-list file, you can actually load it. And so I can just hit made a return on this. And you see in the mini buffer, um, it loaded it as compiled e-list. I could put a .el on here, a .elc, .gz, all of that will work, and just put a dash in front to load it. If you want to run a shell command, just put an exclamation mark in front of something, and again, you can have the environment variable. So here we're saying run the program date, and you see, uh, let's see, let's do it again. There we go. It ran date, and you see the output right there. And what if you want to run a graphical program on your system? Uh, well, here we want to open a PDF file, and I'm just using XDG Open on uh, Linux. So you could use Open on Mac, um, and you just put an ampersand in front. And there's the hyperbole uh, manual instantly displayed. So lots of power there, and all of that actually .pdfs and many other file types are automatically linked to various programs by hyperbole. So you could just use the path name itself and it would probably behave the same way. Number seven, um, bookmarks on steroids. So uh, hyperbole gives you a personal button file, which is on the menu you see here under button files and then personal. Um, so here we'll just display it. And you can put whatever you want in here, these implicit buttons of any type. You can name them uh, the way here, and you can activate either the name with made a return or the button itself. So of course, if we did made a return here, we'd, we'd just display uh, that in a web browser. Uh, I'll just do a few of these. So here's a section of line. Let's just jump there. Uh, but these can be all sorts of different actions that are going on and you just uh, whatever cross references you want you put in here and the neat thing is that this then becomes a list of what we call global buttons so when I go into the menu and I go control H H G A to activate a global button you can see that all the names from this file appear here so only the name buttons appear and I could like go to the hyperbole uh, uh, to-do list and things like that. So very, very quick access to all your information whenever you need it. And that could be an org file as well if you prefer that. Um, so we just took care of that. Number six, 
instant test case running and debugging. This is a fairly new feature. Um, what we're seeing here is a pre-release of version 9, which should be out within the next week. Um, but the instructions at the beginning of the presentation uh, tell you how to get the uh, development version of Hyperbly, which is right now 8.01 pre, but that's virtually the same as what 9 will be. So it, you can grab that as of today. Um, so let's uh, let's just jump to a test file. And what you see here is called an explicit button. You can actually make buttons where similar to org, where you just see a bit of the button and all of the metadata is hidden. Uh, I can say Control H A, and I see all about that button, exactly what it's going to do before I activate it, and even who created it or last modified it. Uh, and then just Q out of here, and you're back where you were. So now, what this did is link us to an ERT test, right? If you write tests in Emacs, you probably use ERT tests. So if I hit made a return on here, it'll just run the test. Tell me it passed. Great. OK, but maybe I had a problem. So let me use control U made a return. And that will uh, e-debug uh, the test instantly. So now I'll step through it, and it says, well, Let's, um, the single line actually creates that explicit button. You see we have an empty buffer here that we're in. Now I step through that, and now there's the explicit button that got put in there. Now the next line, I step through it, and this is going to check if we have the right action type, and it returns true, so that's good. And now we should be, uh, it should be associated with the temp buffer. Returns true, good. And that's why what you saw before is this passed. The whole thing passed. So lots of power there, simple to use. You're just using your meta return and prefix arguments. It's uh, something everybody who develops should have. So number, let's go on. I think we're making pretty good time here, but I turned off my timer. Um, let's go to number five. This is a very new feature, which is very cool too. You used to have to use the mouse probably, and you, you could drag across windows to go from a source to a referent buffer, and that would create a hyperlink for you. But now we've installed it and made it even easier on, we've installed it on a, um, on the hyperbole menus. So let's, uh, let's just go back to our presentation here and say we want to link to this line that we're on there. And I'll just create the button in our scratch buffer here so it doesn't really mess anything up. So I just put my point in where I want the button to appear, and then I put point where I want it to link to in the other, uh, the other buffer. And then I just say Control H H to get my menu, I for implicit button, and then L for link. And boom, it inserts it right at point. And what, it, what did it do? It knew that this was in the hyperbole directory, and I have a variable for that, so that if you sent this link to your friend who uses hyperbole, it would still work, right? Because they have a different hyperbole there. And then uh, I want to go directly to line uh, 116. So boom, it just took me there. So that's it. And hyperbole is doing all this for you. You just say, I want a link to this thing, and it figures out what's at point, and it determines the right type of implicit uh, link to put there. And that's the whole point, is that you're just working like when you're programming or you're writing an article, and you just hit made a return or, or pull up a menu and hit a key binding and you're off to the races. So that was implicit linking. We can also create those explicit link buttons, and as well as the global link, where we would just give it a name, and it would automatically put it in our global button file without us even having that on screen. So lots of power there as well, lots of consistency. Now let's uh, take a look at the K outliner a little more. Uh, I'm just going to show you one feature, actually. I don't have time to show you the K outliner in detail, but it's a really cool structured outliner that even if you love org mode, you should, you should try it. And this is one thing that you can't get with org mode is, let's say, uh, hyperbole comes with an example file um, which teaches you about the K outliner. So we'll just use that right here. And when you're in the K outliner, you can 
bring up and go into the K outliner menu right here at the bottom. And there's a format menu there. You always take the first letter of a menu, the first capital letter of a menu item. So F for format and then D for display and browser. So just let's do it. Boom. We have with one button uh, or one key, we've produced the entire outline in a collapsible uh, outline in HTML. So I can go here. Uh, let me, I just have to use my mouse. So I can expand and collapse these trees live um, with very basic, uh, um, very basic uh, coding. We tried to keep uh, this as simple as possible, but you see it maintains the structure of the outline and even uh, tables. Uh, where are the tables down? Somewhere here. So a lot in here. Yeah, there. Okay. So all the formatting is maintained. And again, it's instant. Or you can just export it to a file without displaying it. Uh, very, very efficient kinds of operations. So that was number four. Number three is uh, a subsystem, another subsystem in hyperbole called high control, which is for window and frame management. And I just wanted to show you one thing in there. It's got a lot of capabilities, but I always had the problem that Emacs wouldn't let me scale my fonts, all of my faces at the same time. I wanted to zoom. I didn't want to uh, increase the default font size and all the others stay the same. So let's just uh, display our faces right here. And, and then we have a choice of either controlling frames or windows. So let's start by controlling frames. So you get another sub menu when you're in high control to tell you what, what to do here. And there's just lowercase z and uppercase z. So let's try it. So it's scaling the entire frame. And you can see from the list of faces that they're all scaling at the same time. And I can go back down. Now, if I switch to window mode, and there's a special fast way to do that, just hit T to toggle. And if you look at the bottom menu, it says frames right now. Now it says windows when I hit T. So now if I do the same Z to increase, it's just this window. And, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's the, the faces in there. So, uh, a lot of power again, but I, I just haven't found anywhere else that you can get that kind of control over your faces very rapidly. So um, that's uh, number three. Now, number two, uh, let's, uh, let's put out of there. So um, the high rollo is uh, the final subsystem in hyperbole. And this has gotten much cooler. So it started off as a contact management system, but it's really just a, a hierarchical record uh, management system that lets you have as many files, directories as you want, and you can search across all of them without any external utilities uh, necessary, just what's built into Emacs and hyperbole. So as you can see, we've uh, expanded it to handle org files, markdown, K outlines, Emacs outlines. So what I'm going to do is just say, I want to search using my high rollo file list. You just set that to what you wanted to search. But now you have all this flexibility. You can use environment variables in it. You can just specify a directory, and it will find all those matching files below that directory recursively. Uh, you can give it the markdown file here. And you can use uh, file wildcards as well. I mean, look at this. It's got an environment. It's got a list variable in it and a wildcard, and it's just all I'm going to do is I change this from a Lisp expression uh, to make it a hyper button. You just change the outer parens to angle brackets, and then it's automatically an implicit um, button that you can activate with made a return. So it just ran that, and now I've set my uh, file list. So now let's do a search. It would be. Uh, control H, H, Rolodex, R, and then S for search. But I'll just do it this way. And boom, it found everything that fast. And I can just get like uh, show the top items in there. So I, I kind of have outlining in this buffer. I can just move to each match that I hit. 
And notice, although everything was collapsed, it's expanding here. When I move in and out of each of the entry matches, it expands or collapses as I move to the next one. Um, so a lot of power there. Uh, what else? So just tabbing through these things. And you notice that it's working across all of these different types. And it's telling you which file everything came from right up here. So I could just made a return here. Should work. Uh, yes, revisit the file normally. And it just pulls it right up. So everything is live and hyperbole. You've got hyperlinks everywhere. Uh, let, let's just uh, get rid of that. Go back to our demo. So um, if you uh, are fans of Vertico and Consult, you can now use that with the high rollo. So all you have to do is let's just uh, format our windows. And then I'll say, let's use Consult Grep. Uh, over the Rolodex. And now it found all the matches there, and I can just move live through them in the buffer like you may be used to. Or I can filter back down and say, uh, using orderless uh, joystick you know, or anything that has joy in it, just match to those lines. And then I can you know, either jump there or quit out of here. I'll just quit out of it right now. So very cool, and all of that is using whatever you personally set as the set of files and directories you want to search. And finally, our number one uh, feature of Hyperbole is you can customize this to give you these kinds of implicit buttons, uh, whatever kind you want. And there are three levels of doing this. Uh, the first is for non-programmers. You can just set a string that, like a URL with a parameter in it. Uh, so the percent %s represents the parameter. And this is how you do a search on DuckDuckGo. So all I have to do is evaluate this def al for action link. And now I have a new implicit button type that I can put between angle brackets. And I just give it that name, ddg, and some parameter, whatever I want to search for. And this is a button that does that search. Very cool, right? So you can embed these. This could be a hyperlink in um, you know, a comment in a programming file. Anything on the entire web that you want to link to, uh, whatever kind of uh, compact notation you want to give it. So that's what we're going to learn as we get more advanced here. You can give it even more compact notations. So as you get more advanced, you can say, well, I don't like this angle bracket. I want to have an implicit button that uses these uh, square brackets and then an angle bracket inside it. So then you need the def IL for um, implicit link. And this lets you specify your start and end delimiters for your new type. And, and then you can give it a function that you want it to run. And that will take the text of whatever is in the button, in this case, test release here, uh, and feed it to the function that I, I gave here. So what this function does is grep over my git log and find any commits that include the term test release in it. So let's try it. First, I have to add the button type. Uh, and that's all it takes. And it defined it now. So anywhere in Emacs now, I can use this button type, essentially. So let me try to activate it. OK, and it says, uh, yeah, let's save it. OK, so now it's running a git log command. It found all the commits. And now, of course, if I had uh, made a return on this commit, it recognizes it as an implicit link. And if I search for, what was it, test release, there it is. So this commit had that in there. So all these matches, so I don't know how other people do this, but for me, this makes it a lot, a lot simpler. Uh, so a lot of power that any programmer can use. And finally, if you've mastered Emacs Lisp or you're starting to, you can uh, look in the HIB types file in Hyperbole and see all sorts of uses of DefIB, which is defined implicit button. And that's the full power of eLisp. Uh, when you want to define one. So what we're going to do here is I wanted to know, uh, given a date, what the day of the week is. And 
because the date primitives weren't quite written the way I might like. Uh, it's a little longer than, than some, but I'm just going to evaluate this list. And I've now defined DOW as a, an action type. Now, how do I know I'm, I'm doing that? So I can always say Control H, Capital A here to see what a button's going to do. And it tells me when I'm there, I, I'm at a hyperbole button. And the, the type is uh, from category DOW. And what's it going to do? It takes some args. It's going to do a message action. OK, so let's try it. So it tells me that's a date, and it falls on a Sunday, which is today. That's correct. So two days from today is a Tuesday. Beautiful. So we've just totally transformed you know, what we can do with text. And you notice there's no markup here. And this is, uh, this is uh, working with all of the other implicit types that we have everywhere in Emacs. It's only going to match to this kind of pattern. Um, and anywhere else, you know, it just won't trigger that type. So lots of power. You just need to get started with hyperbole. There's great documentation, both inside the code, in the manual. There's a fast demo that you can start with, and there's about 10 different videos. There'll be three presentations on hyperbole here at the conference. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I'd love to answer your questions and get some new users for Hyperly. Um, so lastly, I'd like to thank my co-maintainer, Matt, who's going to speak later about the extensive uh, test uh, protocols we have in Hyperbole. Uh, it, Hyperbole works on every version of Emacs from 27.1 up, and every operating system and Windows system that you use. Um, and thanks so much to the volunteers and the speakers at EmacsConf. You do a great job, and we're all really appreciative that you, you take all the time that you do to make this happen. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Bob. So I'll let you do the uh, gymnastics to join us back on BBB and put your webcam. Uh, in the meantime, I'll invite people, as Sasha told you in the introduction, to go put your question in the pad. The link is on the talks page and also on IRC. So take your time. Just uh, We've already got some people who've asked questions. You can also start joining the room. Uh, let me just ping Sasha. Ping to open ID hyper. Amp. So you'll be able to join us on Big Blue Button as well to go chat with Bob more directly. I'm not sure if people have joined already. Not yet. So, uh, yeah. So, Bob, what I'll do, we already have four questions. I'm going to read them to you, and you can take your time answering them. But we do have about seven minutes until we go to the next talk. So we'll need to be a little bit chop-chop. OK. All right. So reading the first questions, and I'm also going to display them for the stream to see. Uh, do buttons keep their metadata within the same file? E.g., would I see it if I change to fundamental mode, for instance? So uh, all of the things that I was showing you, implicit buttons have no metadata. That's the great thing about them, is you just type them in the buffer, and what you see is all there is to that button. And hyperbole uh, generates all the smarts associated with them. When you create an explicit button, which I showed you one or two examples of, that metadata is, uh, there is metadata with that. And that is stored in a separate file in the same directory called .hypp. So it's hidden away, and it doesn't affect the format of the buffer that it's in. So again, what you see is what you get. You just see the delimiters around the explicit button, and that's it. Um, so hyperbole takes care of all that for you. However, if you embed them into like a mail message, which you can, you can mail buttons, then there is a hidden area at the end of the mail message that encodes the metadata for the explicit buttons. OK, great. Uh, next question. Is it possible to link to a file by its ID, like denote, org ID, or some similar unique string inside? Yes, in fact, that's one of the new features in uh, uh, 9. Um, you just uh, made a return on an ID, and it takes you right to uh, the org node. Works with org roam and uh, org straight out of the box. 
Uh, we're looking at ways to make it easier to just insert those in places. But since you have org keys that do that already, you can just insert them in any documents and hyperbole will recognize them. I think uh, in some cases you may need to put ID colon in front of the ID as well. But generally it works. Okay, great. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, regarding the frames example, any thoughts on, or consideration for a transient interface, or is this something one could already toggle? Are you familiar with transient interface? Yes, yes. we don't use transient because we, you know, hyperbole started out in, in 1991, though it's had much, much work since then. Um, so we predate a lot of uh, newer things in Emacs, and then we just use them as as they become useful to hyperbole. Um, we think the, the mini buffer menu is pretty good. We could rewrite stuff in transient, but you know we haven't seen the need yet. Maybe high, uh, high control, that might be a good candidate because there are so many uh, keys in it. So we'll think about that, but it would be a while before we got to it. Right. Uh, moving on to the next question. Sorry, I got really confused because there's a French uh, salut in, in, uh, in the text of it. Is someone saying hi to me or something? All right, next question. Uh, regarding multi-file search functionality, why not implement it with with sorry, why not implement it within the existing framework of MetaX grep or similar built-in commands? Yet another search interface sounds a bit redundant. The multi-file search. Uh, so high rollo, I guess you're talking about. I think what you missed there is that high rollo matches to records, multi-line records. So it's not a line-oriented match. It's a record-oriented match. Um, so, you know, grep, you can say maybe give me three lines of context, but what if I have a 20-line record? Uh, I want to see the whole thing. And so, so it's a full-text search interface uh, which uh, lets you have any size uh, entries or nodes uh, in the match buffer. So that's one reason. Uh, MetaX grep works with hyperbole. I mean, you just you use it if you want, and then you can hit meta return on grep lines. And so, you know, we basically take everything from POSIX and everything in Emacs, and we, we try to make a lot of it simpler to use. We don't take away any of the functionality. We just augment it. Right. And I think that's the logic for a lot of the packages. You know, the philosophy is just you create your little bit, your little island where you do your stuff. And if you can resonate with other islands, so much the better. And it feels like between those islands, you know, hyperbole is a great way to connect things that are just text. So it's always been a lovely philosophy behind it. There's always been a lovely philosophy behind it. One, one other point I'd make there is that uh, the high rollo also contains uh, logical search operators. So when I typed in that string, uh, you could just as well type with like Lisp expression, semi Lisp expression. You can say open paren and word one, word two, close paren. You know, you can have or and XOR and not, and it'll, it'll do the search and just retrieve the entries Again, multi-line entries that match all of the criteria that you specified there. So that's fairly unique, I think. So you basically got a full text search platform with logical operators, instantly, you know, fast moving, rapid uh, keys that you can control everything with. And it's all integrated into this larger framework. Okay, great. Well, Bob, you have two more questions, uh, but I'm, <laughs> there's a big one about what inspired you to write it back, uh, it being hyperbole around the time of its birth. But sadly, we only have about one more minute. So what I'm going to ask you to do, feel free to answer the question. If you go on BBB, I've pasted the link to the other pad. I think you can see it on your computer as well. I have, I have, uh, I have the Etherpad up, so. Uh, right, I'm so what are we going to do? Enough, feel free but... to take your time to... Oh, sorry, I'm just a little bit pressed by time because it's not me controlling when we move on to the next talk, as was evidenced yesterday when we got yonked to the next talk. Uh, so, Bob, feel free to take all the time you want to answer questions. People, if you want to join the Big Blue Button room, the links are available and open on the talk page. You can join and ask as many questions as you want to, Bob. And for us, with the live stream, we'll be moving on to the next talk in about 30 seconds. So, Bob, all that's left is for me to thank you for your presentation again this year and for all your answers. Thank you, Leo.
All right, bye bye, Bob. And we'll be moving bye. on to the next talk in about 10 seconds. See you, see you in a bit. All right, Bob, we are off air, I think, now. Thank you so much. I need to get moving for the next talk. Okay. Uh, is somebody going to keep writing answers in here, or I need to type them in now? Uh, it's probably best now if you read the uh, questions on your, on your okay. own and then answer them. We'll right. collate everything together. We'd just like to have your answers. <laughs> I, I hope uh, I hope some people will join the BBB, but Fingers I'll crossed. start. I'll put a reminder. All right, bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. So let me uh, take a second here to get see what questions we have. Uh, did you, we covered that? The, okay. Uh, the point is, why not upstream search interface? Could you clarify that question? I don't, I don't quite know what that means. So I'll, I'll go on to the next one and come back to that. Hyperly has been around for a number of years now. What inspired you to write it back around the time of its birth? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it, it was born before the World Wide Web, actually, and it was right before. Uh, I remember we were in the midst of a version uh, when the first uh, version of the web occurred. And I, I was thinking that there was going to be an information explosion of uh, unstructured information. And like we, we needed to have much better tools to be able to manage, say, like 5,000 email messages coming in and, you know, uh, all sorts of uh, non-database oriented information structures. So I said, we need an advanced interactive hypertext system and it needs to work with all the, the general capabilities that we use like, like email and uh, you know, our document production systems. So I was doing research at the time at a university and I, I decided uh, to work on something that we call personalized information environments. And there's a paper about this out there if you want to dig it out on the web. Uh, so PIES, as they were called, uh, was an architecture which would have a bunch of um, managers, like Hi Hyperbole was one of the managers, the hypertext manager, and, and then a bunch of uh, point tools that would leverage the managers, like an email reader would be a point tool that would leverage the hypertext manager. And uh, so the first, I did in fact write something called PyMail, uh, which was very much Gmail-like uh, before Gmail. And so inside, and, and I did a, it was like R mail in a way, um, but inside your R mail summaries, for example, you could have explicit buttons embedded and that were drawn from the subject of your email message and they'd work just like, you know, the, the regular button. So it was very flexible and it had, uh, it had rule based processing and things. So hyperbole came out of that and it's come a long way, but it's still, you know, a very useful uh, core hypertext system, hypermedia system, I should say. Are you familiar with the Embark package? I am a bit. I've just started using it. I think there's some overlapping functionality with hyperbole. Yes. Yes, we found that uh, people over time have enjoyed hyperbole and have started replicating some of its features, you know, small amounts of the features. Um, I, I talked to, I, I hope I don't miss his name, but O. Antlin, uh, who uh, writes that once in a while we dialogue. And uh, I think Embark is great, you know, I'll, I'll give him some, um, some pointers too. And he thinks that Embark and Hyperbole are quite compatible too, just like Oregon Hyperbole. So that's how we'd like to keep it. And, um, you know, some people prefer just the small uh, package of Embark. Uh, and it does different things than what Hyperbole does. So, so I think you use all of these tools together. Um, and they, they can work very well together. Any other questions? Anybody still here? If not, probably people are off to another talk. So thank you very much. 
and uh, you know, again, look for hyperbole version 9 in uh, the next week. Thanks very much. Bye. Should I leave BBB? Oh, Alpha Papa's here. Hey. Good to see you. Uh, all right, well. Well, I'll stay for another minute, but I think uh, I'm going to go off video two and start listening to another talk. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Bob, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Have you been answering questions we've been able to I uh, finished answering the questions. We're all done. Okay, cool. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to close the room unless you want to go a little longer because this talk that we're playing right now is finishing really quick and we don't have a Q&A afterwards. So do you, you want to stay on air or something? Yeah, if you let people know to come back because someone to go hear that presentation, I can stay. Sure, I'll make an announcement then, and you can stay. We'll just put on BBB. You can stay muted until people join, but this way it okay. opens up when you say people to join. And if no one shows up in five minutes, we'll all go on break. Uh, does that sound okay? Great, thank you. Cool. Uh, I'll go back to the uh, uh, management in the background, and I'll let you know. Where are you? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, sorry, I kind of need to run. I'll, I'll be back in about two minutes. Okay. Okay, Bob, I've won the stream. Uh, we are joining it now. We've got about five seconds. And I think we are back. Hi. Uh, so, see if yeah, sorry, uh, go on, Bob, please. I was going to say, how, can we see if anybody comes back in the room how do you tell there's uh, well, the name you, should, you should be able to see uh, to show on the left you've got on bb button you've got a button i'm showing it on the stream but you've got a little button that allows you to show the people joining so yeah I've... what everyone mm -hmm. uh let's see if you had more question on your pad that we could be taking in the meantime let's just try give me a second okay. to find your pad. here we go an error occurred Okay. Well, All right, it's loading up. Feels like there's an AI writing <laughs> this stuff on the pad. How's it? 
Is this one? So, oh no, this is a different one, sorry. So which question are you looking at now? Uh, it was a different pad, that was the problem. All right. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, I'm back. So yeah, it looks like, is anybody back? Send, uh, if you're here, send a chat message. Yeah, because it's been something. Uh, you have, apparently, whenever we leave those BBB chat room open, the moment we go off air, people start joining and asking a lot of very interesting questions. And you know, that's all well and good. We'll be able to put them on the page later on. But it'd be great if you could also have those discussions when we are live, because a lot of people would benefit from the brilliance that goes on in those rooms. So please don't be shy. Please don't be shy. Join and talk. So we're on the general stream now? Yep, we are back on the general stream. We have about uh, until 10 of the next hour, which is 19 oh. minutes. Just well, why don't you and I talk? So what, have, you ever tried, have you ever tried hyperbole, Leo? I have never, but uh, you know, it feels like every year when uh -huh. you present something, it feels like I already know so much because the concept <laughs> of buttons, it feels like it's also something that we've reinvented many times in Emacs. It's mm -hmm. like conversion to evolution, except you're the one who started like ahead of everyone else. Well, that's a good point because, uh, you know, we have uh, Emacs itself has push buttons, which you see like in the help buffers. And those used to, we didn't really do anything with those. But now we've subsumed them as implicit buttons as well. So your made a return will work on those anywhere too. So, uh, you know, we're trying to get, you, you use one key, right, to control every type of button that you have. It works on org links, org buttons anywhere, um, or URLs, uh, because it's so simple. All you need is like five to 10 lines of code to map you map the pattern that represents a concept, right? And then you can create an infinite number of those buttons from that type. That's what's really cool about hyperbole is uh, say I have a 500 page document and it uses a really weird format for cross-referencing, right? I write my three lines of pattern match um, to work with that. And then everywhere throughout that document and the hundreds of other documents that will be created with that format, they're all live buttons instantly. Nothing changed about the document. That's really cool. You know, org mode, we have global org buttons, but, um, you know, mostly it has to be embedded within an org file, right? And follow that yeah. syntax. With hyperbole, it's, it's like we can adapt as, uh, as the world adapts around us uh, to whatever formats people want to use that day. And you can even change things, you know, to look the way you want, right? And have your own cross references. There's something built into hyperbole that's not really active, uh, which was sort of uh, along the Zettelkasten uh, uh, way. We we wrote this a long time ago. It's called hib-doc.el, and it's a card catalog um, notion. So it, it uses the high rollo in the background but it lets you create these forms uh, that are cards that you fill out with whatever kind of data you want. And then it gives you the full text searching across the cards. And each card has a unique ID that uh, you can reference similar to org IDs, um, but these are human readable and human typable. And uh, so you can, you can just have a, a cross-reference to any doc ID and essentially create what Engelbart used to call a, a journal, uh, which is all these IDs on documents that point you directly to the document archive so that you could have like your internal publishing system. And, um, you know, it's very simple to do and it's just one module added on to hyperbole. Yeah, it's, it's especially interesting for me, you know, because coming back to this idea of convergent evolutions, it's funny because the parameters are a little different. For us, with org buttons, you know, we're very happy. Like a lot of the stuff during EmacsConf is run with org mode. Like we have ELISP going everywhere to compile a lot of uh, org um, properties, like 
you know, speaker information, for instance, how long the talk is, the title and all this, you know, we have all of this in an org file, which we use as a database, but then we can do so much stuff. Like we can send email and we can update the schedule. By the way, if you're interested in this, we'll have a talk on a dev track in the afternoon today that Sasha did, and it's wonderful. I'm just teasing it. Oh, that's great. But, but coming back to hyperbole, you know, for you, it feels like the parameters were slightly different because the feeling was, I just want a tunnel that can work between any type of files. Now, it's all well and good, you know, all Chrome, um, Denote, and all the stuff like this, they create bidirectional links, but it's only between org mode files. Whereas what you're achieving with hyperbole, and if you've done it much earlier than everyone else, is that you have this concept regardless of the type of file that you're using. And I find this to be beautiful. Like five years ago, whenever you were talking about hyperbole, I did not have a concrete idea of what was happening. But ever since I've gone through the journey of really understanding what the custom method were about, it feels like you were foreigners in the topic. Obviously, you've mentioned the mother of all demos by Edward Engelbart. But those ideas are not novel. But it feels like only now are they starting to be appropriated by people, especially in free software. And it's really good to see. But I'm really excited to, well, have my small part to play in this. And I'm also excited to be able to chat with you and people like Bastian and uh, other people about all those topics. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's fun that we can laugh now about when people say uh, people are still using Emacs, you know, is because they're not used, certain people aren't using it. They have no idea of how far it's come and how powerful it is. And you know, we're leveraging ELISP heavily, obviously, but if you look at the definition of our types, they look exactly like uh, defunds in ELISP. And we've been able to do that because of LISP macros. Um, you know, we so we basically have our own domain specific language there, but there's yeah. almost nothing to learn because it's just like what you know from ELISP. Uh, so again, you know, taking a concept and leveraging it, abstracting it, and leveraging it multiple times uh, gives you a lot of power. And people, you know, somebody said the other day, and I said, finally, this quote happened. He said, there's so many thing, uh, so many things that I do with hyperbole every day that I forget that I'm using hyperbole. Uh, because it's just so embedded in this guy's uh, workflow. And that's really how I use it. You know, there are features in there, can't use everything, right? So uh, there are features that I don't use, but I use a lot of things and it's all like muscle memory, just like the keyboard, the, the uh, Emacs key bindings. So it's very exciting to get to that level. And now, you know, we haven't started with the chat bots or any of the AI integration, but I'm starting to think about that a little bit and how we'll interface to that world. And I, I think it's going to be very exciting. Yeah, likewise. And I think it harks back to what we were uh, talking about before when we mentioned hyperbole being a package inside of an ecosystem that is Emacs. But it's not because something is well circumscribed in terms of feature set that it does not influence everything around it. Like hyperbole can be used with something completely uh, at the opposite end of what it was intended for, just because it provides a good set of tools that can be used wherever else you want in Emacs. And it's the same thing with org mode. It's the same thing with many, many different things. And it feels like integrating AIs or you know generative AIs into Emacs would provide such um, such a tool that could apply to any kind of other major mode or any kind of other use. So I'm also excited to see this. It feels like we are uh, sitting at the brink of a revolution. I'm not going to say the acne stuff, but it definitely feels like right now by trying to see what we can do with AI, it's definitely going to change the way not only we program, but also the way we take notes and the way we design stuff, arcing back to what uh, John Wigley said yesterday about his draft program on Mac OS. Um, Bob, if you don't mind, let's. I see people typing questions, and I also see people joining on the blue button. So I'm going to read you the two questions that have been added. Is that OK? Great, great. Go for it. Cool. So first question, wow, what you are describing now, and that's when you were talking about the bidirectional links, and especially um, 
the last question in, in its entirety. What you're describing now reminds me a lot about hypercards that I grew up on. Do you know if hyperbole inspired Bill Atkinson or if you were inspired by hypercard? Or were there just a lot of thought about hypercontextuality around that time? All right. Well, this is uh, this is another interesting anecdote. I don't know if it's true or not, but I think hypercard uh, predated uh, our stuff, or it was right around the same time uh, when hyperbole was starting out. But when I was doing the Pi research, I, I worked at uh, when, when I left school. I worked at Motorola, and we did a lot of work with Apple back then. And somebody came back and he said. You know the people over there have seen your uh, your Pi research, and they really liked it a lot. And uh, and so they were leveraging that when they decided to create the division that they called Apple Pi, um, which was the uh, originator of the Newton, which you know eventually led to the iPhone. So it all kind of <laughs> is interconnected, just like you know the impact that free software has had around the world. So you never know where your stuff is going to go or end up. Right. All right, moving on to the next question. Is it possible to only use one feature of hyperbole without the others, i.e. using only the implicit explicit buttons without eye control, eye roller, or without having to rewrite part of the code in hyperbole in order to be able to load a smaller hyperbole? Does it make sense? Yes, we get asked this all the time. So. You can use any little bit that you want anywhere, right? You could even just call code from hyperbole. Um, I mean, you don't use everything in Emacs, right? But you still install Emacs on your machine. It's exactly the same thing. Um, those libraries don't take up any memory. They take up a little disk space. And it's so trivial compared to the amount of disk we have today. So it, a lot of things are not loaded unless you activate them. Um, and so yeah, I know that you do have to build all those things. So maybe that's what bothers people. It takes you know uh, two minutes if you're if you're using you know it depends how fast your computer is. But you you build it once on install like every other package. And we, uh, it used to be that there would be a lot of warnings just because of the way we wrote the code, and we didn't really have to deal with some of those warnings. But with this new release, we've gotten rid of almost all of them, including the um, um, the native compiler messages. So it should be a very clean install now, and uh, just use use one part at a time. And, but the other parts are there in case you make a link to something and you use a facility just like i was showing as i went across subsystems today it may take you a year but then all of a sudden you find the use case for high rollo and you say oh i'm glad i have it there and yes the some of these things could be split into sub packages like you do in the org ecosystem but given our limited resources on the team we find having them all in one gives us a higher level of quality unless it's to deliver a better integrated system for your use. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, it's, uh, it's not a monolith. Uh, I mean, it's usually easy, easy, more easy, <laughs> more easy. Sorry. I was, I was right on the first try. It was, it's usually easier to maintain a monolith that contains many bits of functionality like org. You have plenty of people using org mode not using right. org agenda for instance or you've got plenty of people using old mode and barely using babel because it doesn't really uh translate to their use you know and i feel like i very much agree with you it's okay to install a package and only use some of the functions i was reminded as it was just as you were discussing this of the consult package which is part of the vertico uh you know embark and uh, marginalia and all this you know consult it replaces a lot of the uh, Emacs built-in commands, like for finding your buffers or finding text uh, inside of your buffer. You know, it's uh, it's great, and you do not need to completely move to consult as you get started. You know, you can start colonizing one step at a time the function that you usually use. And I highly recommend to people to not let the size of a project deter them from trying it out, because, again. In Emacs, everything is horizontal. If somehow you want to, you know, 
use something that was not intended primarily for this, or if you only want to use 10% of a package, well, do it. Uh, an example that I have for me is that Lispy is the major mode, uh, sorry, a minor mode that I use for editing uh, eLisp documents. And it's great, you know, eLisp, uh, it provides similar functions to Paradit, which might be a little more popular, which allows you to have modal editing when you are on specific parts of a file, like the opening parenthesis or the closing parenthesis. Well, it's great. It provides modal editing for those modes, but I certainly do not know everything every modal command associated to it, I just use the one that makes the most sense to me. So right. feel free to explore. Uh, and, you know, I'll just say, because we get this so much, it's not that large. I mean, there's a fair number of files, but it's just like one major directory and then the K outliner directory. And you know, when you look at these things, you install web applications, everything else, you know, just when you download the source code, it's much, much smaller than any of that. So I, I don't know why people, you know, except that it's larger than your typical package, why there's yeah. really an issue there. It's, I think it's because people tend to assume that uh, a paradigm like the one you're describing, which seems to be, you know, changing the way you use Emacs in a way because you're no longer thinking of, as buffers as separate entities, you can tunnel between them, you know, it feels like a huge paradigm shift. And you assume that the code behind it is going to be humongous as well, but it's usually not the case. It's just that the idea is very pure at the start and the paradigm shift that it allows is also magnificent. But at the end of the day, the code is fairly simple because it does one thing and it does it well. Well, one thing I noticed too, I mean, I'm a big believer in turnkey kind of systems. In fact, a long time ago when I built an IDE on Emacs called InfoDoc, uh, that was delivered pre-compiled. You know, so it's like you download it like every other app and you run it. And, and so I think eliminating all the friction that occurs. And, you know, I just got going recently with the wonderful uh, packages that you just mentioned, uh, Vertigo and Consult. But, you know, they, they don't have a manual that covers all that. They use sort of like a cookbook uh, wiki online to answer a lot of the questions that people have. And everybody has to figure out their configurations, you know, to make these things all uh, work together. We, we like to do that engineering and say, here it is, you know. It's like if you want to configure it and make it your own, you can do it. But there is a default configuration that handles all the typical use cases, and you can just load it up and run because it's made to use. Not you know, it's you don't have to hack it to make it useful for you. Yeah, it reminds me of the discussion we had with Stefan yesterday about saying defaults, and I think the question uh, was. Uh, Emacs should probably ship with sane defaults for people. And Stefan's answer was, well, my sane defaults might not be the same thing as your sane defaults. And that's why I think it's important really to have a core set of features, be it with hyperbole of org mode, that is well-documented, as you mentioned. But what I like about this in a way, and I think hyperbole is perhaps taking more benefits of this than org mode, is that the self-documentation aspect of it feels like it's easier with hyperbole because you're not bound by org mode buffers. You can link to just about everything. And for me, this ability to self-document is, well, first, very true to the philosophy of Emacs in the first place, but also opens up those resonance uh, cycles where, oh, you get interested and then you start reading up and then the documentation is so good that it feeds into your practice and then it goes nuclear and you gain so much knowledge as a result of this. All right, Bob, uh, we are about out of time. We only have about one minute until we go to the next talk. Do you have any parting words? Uh, I do. I think, um, you know, the, the world's complex. It's getting more uh, complex. I think that's why people use Emacs in the first place, because it's a big system. You wouldn't use it unless you wanted it to simplify your life. Um, Hyperbole is built with the same idea in mind. You may not get it, just like Lisp, a lot of people don't understand when they first encounter it, but when they do understand it, they're blown away. It changes their life. 
you know, when you really understand implicit buttons, uh, I think that's one of the things in hyperbole that can change your Emacs working life. So just give that a try. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised across time. Thanks very much. And thank you so much, Bob. We'll be moving on to the next talk in about 20 seconds. So everyone, see you in a bit. And Bob, thank you so much again. Thank you, Leo. Take Bye -bye. care. All right, I think we are off air now. So thank you so much, Bob. I'm going to need to step out and get ready for the next talk. Yeah, do your thing. You do a great job at it. But I, I wanted to ask you where in London you are. Uh, I'm not in London. I just, I'm in, I'm in France and I just spent oh. time in London. <laughs> oh, okay. Got it. Sorry, I Bye. thought you were. Take care. Okay. All right, bye-bye, Bob.